Issachar that they had an understanding of the times and they could advise and tell what Israel should do. They stood out. They were distinguished. They were outstanding and they were standing out. I pray you'll be outstanding in Jesus' mighty name. If you don't sharpen your skills, you don't read current affairs. It's just Bible, Bible, Bible. They might ask you what is the capital of America and you say White House. Or they say, what is the opposite of antibiotics? And you say, uncle biotics. I pray that would not be your portion in Jesus' name. How do you want to influence your audience and stakeholders? How do you want to influence them? If you can't effectively engage and understand them, if you can't speak their language, most of our churches are filled with all kinds of people from various nations. We have our footprints in many nations. Indeed, they told us that if you are sent to a nation where they don't speak English, the first thing you need to do is to learn the language. You need to connect. God will help us in Jesus' mighty name. You know, if, even if you look at Paul's leadership style, <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 to 22, 1 Corinthians 9, 20 to 22, says, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I was with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything so that I can save more. So he must have studied Judaism. He must have studied, you know, you just need to understand these things so that you can connect. My prayer is that you connect in Jesus' mighty name. Proverbs twenty-two twenty-nine, 29. Proverbs twenty-two twenty-nine 29. It says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Any minister that wants to be at the cutting edge of ministry must pay attention to leadership development. The Bible says that, you know, uh, the, the, the light of, of, uh, of a righteous uh, shines brighter and brighter. You need to go from one level of glory to another level of glory. There's a difference between the glory of the star and the glory of the moon and the glory of the sun and the Shekinah glory of God. You need to just step up. Ministers that want to be at that cutting edge, you need to develop yourselves so that you can stand before kings, presidents, governors, captains of industries, leaders of thoughts and effectively engage them. You know, when we're growing up, and even still now, many people love to attend dinners. But when it's cocktails, uh, they don't like cocktails. Because at cocktails, no seats. You have to engage people. You have to talk to people. That is when you know those who are savvy, who, who, who are on top of their games. And you find out in some, in some fora, you know, people just cluster together. Those that can't engage people of different nationalities, they cluster together and, and, and talk nothing when other people are engaging others. My prayer is that we broaden the scope of our minds in Jesus' mighty name. The more skilled a leader is, the more his or her service index will increase and the better the output Leaders must be versatile. You must be broad-minded. You must do a lot of things. Exodus 11, 2. Exodus 11, 2, the NIV version. It says, invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight. For you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. For example, this COVID-19. I pray not affect us in Jesus' mighty name. But some businesses have shut down. But scripture is saying, don't just put all your eggs in one basket. You should do a lot of things. Deuteronomy 28, 8, Deuteronomy 28, 8 says that God will bless your storehouses. God expects you to be engaged in many things. I sit 
on various corporate boards. I am my sweetheart. And if you don't understand the business, you will be hoodwinked. You'll be hoodwinked. As chairman of, or as vice chairman of Redeemer's University Board of Trustees, I had to interview a lot of professors when we wanted to appoint uh, a new vice chancellor. I had to study hard, read wide, science, agriculture. Oh, you know, I just read wide. I did a lot of research. So much so that after grilling them, they thought I was a professor. But I did a research on interviews, on how to take on professors. So I was able to hold my own. Can you imagine them saying all that grammar and all that and just don't understand anything? God will have to help us in Jesus' mighty name. In January 2018, to the glory of God, I was appointed as the special assistant to the General Vassia on CSR. We gathered our members and skilled persons that worked in CSR units at various multinationals. We went for seminars. We held meetings. We had courses at the Lagos Business School. That's our Nigeria own Harvard University for a better understanding of CSR. And I found out from my own research that this thing should not be called corporate social responsibility, but Christian social responsibility. The fundamental principle of CSR are enshrined in the most salutary injunction of God to love your neighbor as yourself. And this has been practiced by Christians of old, long before the advent of the first and the oldest company in the world called Congo Gumi, which was incorporated in 578 AD, less than 2,000 years ago. This was long ago practiced among Christians. In Leviticus 25, 30, 35, Leviticus 25, 35, the Bible says that if your brother becomes poor and sick and cannot maintain himself with you, you should support him as though he were a stranger. Take him in. And there are many scriptures like that, even before the first company was incorporated. And I found out that many contemporary English words have their, have their, 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 their foundation from Latin. And I found out meaning of company. Company in Latin is come and panis, which means breaking bread together, which was the age-old culture of Christians. So, CSR, even if you look at it, I mean, God said, let there be light. That's infrastructure. He created bright lights. <laughs> That's the beginning of CSR. But I began to advocate that because this Christian social responsibility began before corporate, then it should be corporate. It should be Christian social responsibility and not corporate social responsibility. And the real Christian social responsibility activities predated corporate CSR, more so as the first one was incorporated less than 2,000 years. So the church is meant to be the example to the world, for the world to follow, and not the other way around. Many of us, we've been saying corporate social, corporate social. I said, no, it shouldn't be, because I did my research. And I put the result of my research in a book called Christian Social Responsibility, A Matter of Life and Death. Because that's the question Jesus is going to ask us on Judgment Day in Matthew 25, 41 to 46. Jesus has already told us that on that Judgment Day we'll stand before him. And he says, huh, when I was hungry, you gave me no meat. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. When I was a stranger, you couldn't care less. You didn't take me in. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was sick, you couldn't 
care. I was in prison. You did not visit me. And many of them say, ah, who would say Jesus in prison? And who go and visit him? says, you know, as long as you don't do it to your neighbor, the least of this, you haven't done to me. And because of that, he says, go to hell. So it's a matter of life and death. Verse 46 says, this shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I wrote that book. And we looked at the work we have been doing globally as a mission. We formulated an online policy document. We never had a policy before. We're just doing the work, just doing the work. But we said there must be a policy. There must be structure. We had an operation manual to ensure best practices. And that's what all our mission fields all over the world are using right now. Then we also incorporated a foundation, His Love Foundation. Today, we have an e-porter that reports all our global CSR activities. And at the press of the button, I can give you data as to the number of centers that we have. For example, in Nigeria, we have about 47,000 centers that we're doing CSR. The details of work done monthly and the total expenditure. And we put this out. Older Consulting did an annual report because of this, they saw our numbers. We engaged them. They featured RCCG CSR side by side with that of the Catholic Church because they could now see the global, the global impact. We have data. And they, in their annual report, called it Christian Social Responsibility. It had never happened before. Cambridge University, they heard of what we're doing and they sent a professor to come and study RCCU CSR just because I challenged the status quo and upped my skills. We attended seminars, we did research. Today, I'm invited to speak at international conferences on Christian social responsibility in matter of life and death. Between my sweetheart, my sugar baby, Pastor Shuju, and myself, we have written over 20 books. And even during this lockdown, <laughs> we have written 11 new books which are coming out. And they were written during the lockdown. You can check them on Amazon.com and Barnes and & Noble and other stores, online stores. The Bible says imitate Christ. I always say that there's no copyright when it comes to things of God. Just copy it right. Ephesians 5.1 Amplified says, be imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example as well beloved children. Imitate their father. Jesus is the fountain of knowledge and wisdom. He ministered to all, including marketplace Christians. Jesus began his life as a businessman. He was a, a carpenter, a recognized craftsman found in the marketplace. He was recognized as a businessman, Mark 6.3. They said, is not this the carpenter? Did he say, is not this is the rabbi? They described him by his occupation. And he must have made some profit too. In Matthew 13.55, Matthew 13, 55, they called him the carpenter's son. That means that that was a family-owned business. He prayed at night or interacted during the day. Just imitate him. How did he succeed? As a marketplace connoisseur, the examples he gave in his parables shows that he was well-informed and familiar with the marketplace and its op operation. He spoke about construction. He spoke about winemaking. He talked about farming treasure hunting, ranching. He had information, management and labor, even hostile takeovers. Check it. Return on investment. <laughs> Futures market like Dow Jones and Nasdaq Futures. He's talked about it. Crop yield, need for observation and research, misuse of money and bankruptcy. Jesus Christ was knowledgeable. He developed himself. He hobnobbed 
the people. He got information and he used them to minister. That was why he could minister to all and sundry. He knew about fishing, advantage of leverage, venture capital in high risk situation. This is Jesus. People of God, he was born in the marketplace, in the inn. Wise man, not paupers. Wise men came to see him. They gave him gifts, very expensive gifts. Who are his disciples? Professional fishermen. Peter and Andrew, they had trawlers. John was a prolific writer. He wrote the book of John, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, and the Revelation. Philip was a great scholar. Judas was an accountant. Even though he stole, but he was an accountant. Jesus understood teamwork, partnerships. Luke was a doctor. Matthew was working for the IRS, IRS. Was a tax collector. Nathaniel, a farmer. Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla, they were tent makers. He didn't just hang out with church folk. <laughs> People of God, we need to step up. A papa family. Let me talk about a papa family. A papa family is, a, is an ideology. And what we do is just to imitate Christ. We follow our general overseer as he follows Christ. First Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11.1. Our family was birthed about 30 years ago by General Sia. He chose 50 people. Our leader was a medical doctor. The old church, the headquarters didn't have any appeal to us. Many of us were not going there. The professionals were not going there. The Yorkies were not going there. And to cut it all, it was on Cemetery Road. So if you say you are going to church, they say you are going to Cemetery Road. We didn't want to die. So we didn't want to go to Cemetery Road. So the general said in his wisdom created a church for professionals. And a leader introduced the use of slides to teach and spoke our language and was very innovative. We used to go to nightclubs, so he said, okay, let me come and start church in your nightclub. And that way, <laughs> you know, we felt comfortable in church. People of God, we are the DNA of excellence. We were driven, and we're still driven. We see ourselves as trailblazers, as space setters. And there was an explosion. All those that were not coming to church, they started coming to church. We set up churches all over the world. We mentored people in the marketplace. Our audience, our church members, they were professionals, stockbrokers, lawyers, entrepreneurs, farmers, CEOs, teachers, police and military officers, factory workers, doctors, Footballers, we even had uh, football, uh, uh, a club in uh, the uh, what do you call this, the Premier League. Nurses, journalists, bankers, all having great influence in the mainstream of society. And a pastor who stand before them and minister unto them. People of God, we needed to be like Paul. He says, Follow me as I follow Christ. We need to be like our general here. Follow me as I follow Christ. We need to understand and speak the language of the audience and stakeholders that we are called to, to come and minister to. Like Paul did. When it comes to Jews, I'll do like a Jew. Gentile, I'll be like a Gentile. Today, we have members and people of influence all over the nations. Marketplace Christians. In Nigeria alone, we have 1,300 churches. And we're in five continents. We have a vice president, a vice president of Nigeria, to the glory of God, is a member of the family, is a member of our redeemed presentation of God. We have governors, we have ministers, we speak to governments and we affect policies because we trained ourselves, we developed ourselves. At the beginning of the lockdown, there was a briefing at the White House by the president. And I was listening to them when they wanted to start the lockdown. The vice president of the United States of America, Mike Pence, when he was trying to engage with the people that don't worry about this lockdown, he quoted scripture and I was happy. He says, where two or three are gathered together in the name of Jesus, you can do church. So don't worry, do church in your hopes. I was so amazed. And that's what this is all about. When we speak, they listen. And by God's grace, we can hold our own everywhere because of self-development. As you know, 
my sugar baby and I, are lawyers, members of the noble profession. The general Basia is an accomplished applied mathematician. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deed. He didn't just, I mean, I don't want you to seem just like an old man with a staff. They said he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And there was wisdom there. He must have learned hieroglyphics, astronomy, mathematics, philosophy, poetry, medicine. He was able to stand on his own and take on anybody. The general here sometimes uses his secular knowledge of mathematics to explain spiritual matters for better understanding. He has a sermon and a book on mathematics of marriage. He did abandon his mathematics. He preached on the mathematics of greatness when the Unilag, you know, called him, you know, and they gave him a doctorate uh, degree in 2015. He was speaking to professors. Uh, mathematics of greatness. It, amazing. The way he just was able to, you know, ply his way through. And I preached a sermon that I call Ibijus Ibi Remedium. Latin, I love Latin. And I was able to say that that is what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That where there is a problem or a temptation, there is always a solution. As you look at the flock of God, don't neglect your own spiritual, physical well-being, personal development, and work balance. Alexander the Great, he said, I'm not afraid of an army of lions led by a sheep, but I'm afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. Because when you see the dexterity and the gait of a lion walking, striding and running, you know that the lion is the king of the jungle. And I dare say to you that we, you and I, are of the tribe of the lion of Judah. People of God, just adopt a religious style of observation, action, and reflection. It's, it's you know, Observe what you've had, act on it, and think back. The journey to great leadership. Salvation. Are you saved? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? He's a teacher. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. So you can't teach other people until you have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Luke 1, 74, I think it's Zechariah that said it. He says we are delivered and saved to serve. That's why God saved you. To serve. To serve people. To minister to people. Follow the leader's example. Jesus Christ. He didn't just sit down and read Bible. Or there wasn't even Bible. He was versatile. He read wide. He had wisdom. Identify your leadership style. Invest in leadership development. Apart from Bible, read other books. There are leadership books, there are biographies, all kinds of books. Arrange for formal leadership training. Get a mentor that will coach you. I generally say is a coach. People of God, look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2 1 to 2. It says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And all things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others. You have to teach others. You have to train. The pathway to great ministry. The curriculum, I put it there. Strategic leadership, ethical leadership, team leadership, home leadership, self-leadership. It's a curriculum. As I run to a close, the Bible says in Proverbs 24.4, he says, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Knowledge is that which distinguishes leaders and separate the lightweight from the heavyweight. Read books, attend courses, be exposed to current affairs, be familiar with technology and trends, and always be on top of your game. Look at us now. We are on Zoom. <laughs> if you can't step up, then you are cut off. There is always something new to learn. The leader that has stopped learning, has stopped leading. Next thing, you need to be humble. You need to be humble. 
Remain humble. Doesn't matter what you are, where you are, be humble. Humble yourself in the hands of God, and God will lift you up. And of course, the Bible says that we are huh, taken in the furnace of affliction. I and mean, there'll be challenges, there'll be adversities, but you have to keep going on. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Jesus went through. You too will go through. And will come out shining bright in Jesus' mighty name. Praise the name of the Lord. No matter where the gap is in your development as a leader, hold on to God. He is faithful to help you, to keep you, and to uphold you unto that perfect day. And I know that if you are listening to me today, then you need to be confident of this very thing, that he that has started a great work in your life is more, more than able to finish it. What do I see? What do you see? I see kings. I see priests. I see children of the lion of the tribe of Judah. I see diamonds in the rough. I see living legends. Legendary people. I see God's VIP. And I think it is time to unleash the giant that is in you. God has given every one of us talents. You are peculiar people. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That should show for the presence of Jesus. You have something to offer this world. There's an assignment. Something that God wants you to do. You are special. Your fingerprints belong to you alone. There's no one like you on the face of this earth. You are a transformational leader. And you need to initiate change. Organize people. Train people. Lay proper foundation. But the change starts with you. Mentor people. So that after you are long gone, the music is still played. Leave your footprints in the sands of time. Your life must count. Today we're still reading about Jesus, reading about Peter, reading about great people that passed on. Kenneth Higgin. These are great people. They impacted the world. And I believe that if they can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do it. You just need to step up. Wisdom is the principal thing. Get knowledge. Get wisdom. That's what the Bible says. And if you do that, the world is at your feet. So, I'd like to say, develop yourselves. All the things I've said is just the <laughs> tip of the iceberg. But start reading so that you can speak. It's a great platform that God has given you. You speak to lives. You speak to souls. You transform lives. Not many people have that kind of platform. As a minister, minister of God, oh my God. And God has said that that is a secret to the covenant of greatness. And my prayer is that as we step up, God will support us, He will help us, or the help you need, the anointing you require, God will grant it to you. And most importantly, at the end of it all, having led others, you won't be cast away. And when we stand before Jesus on that day, you say, well done, <laughs> thou good and faithful servant, faithful minister that knew his assignment, that fulfilled his assignment. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I pray that will be your portion in Jesus' mighty name. Shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you. We bless your holy name. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you adoration. King of glory, we thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the seed that you have sown. Father, O oh Lord, we pray that you germinate into a mighty tree. Father, use us mightily. Let our lives count. That which you have put in our lives. Father, we pray that you bring many people our way and we have to affect people positively. At the end of it all, 
Let our lives be profitable unto you. The things we have had, let us be doers of it. All the help that we require to step up and acquire skills so that we can minister more veritably, more effectively, so that we can remain relevant for that grant to us. We we'll give you all the glory. We we'll give you all the honor. We we'll give you all the adoration. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. God bless you and thanks for listening. Hello? Hello? Wow. Wow. This is awesome. We really want to thank our speaker, Pastor ID, for such a very impactful presentation. Wow. And I'm going to make a request subject to the magnanimity of our guest speaker. If you can please grant us the opportunity of having the presentation. Hallelujah. This is awesome. And we pray that the Lord will continue to increase Pastor ID in wisdom, in knowledge, in anointing, in grace and favor, in the name of Jesus. Now, before we go into the next segment, I would just want to quickly run through uh, a few of the things that Pastor ID has shared with us this afternoon. He started by asking us who is a minister. And of course, it took us to the origin. That is Genesis chapter 12, where God called out Abraham. He referred us to Matthew 20, 26, where essentially he told us that a leader is primarily a servant. Now, the next thing he made us to understand is that we as ministers, how does God see us? God sees us as a flame of fire. What does fire do? Fire influences. Fire burns. It burns out the chaff. Fire purifies. In other words, it's summarized by saying, God has called us to, as leaders to be fire and fire influences. So leaders are influencers. Then he went us to let us know about the leadership style of our Lord Jesus Christ. Generally about leadership, before you went to the leadership style of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does a leader typically, what does he do? What is he called to do? Number one, to influence. And that involves, if you are going to influence, that involves character development. In order, because you can teach what you know, but you can only reproduce who you are. There is said there are also God has called us as leaders to be transformational agents. In other words, we are meant to be change agents wherever we find ourselves. We are meant to be initiators and we are meant to influence others. We are meant to be initiators. We must be a people that takes initiative. The next thing that I quickly look at the leadership style of our Lord Jesus Christ. How did Jesus, how did he transform himself into a leader? Number one, he said he ordained 12. The first thing that he ordained the people who will later be with him to carry out the 
exercise that God has given him to do. Number two, he fought them. After ordaining them, he fought them. Number three, he trained them. And thereafter, he sent them out. And I love the Latin maxim that pastor said he lost to quote, which is Nemo that could not habit. In other words, you cannot give what you don't have. So Jesus had to first train them, he fought them before sending them out. And what did Jesus have that singled him out as a leader that made him to be distinguished and outstanding? He made us to understand the first thing that he had was the Holy Spirit. The second thing was the wisdom of God upon him. Number three was knowledge. Number four was passion to learn. He sat down for three days. I couldn't forget all those points. He sat down for three days, reasoning with philosophers of his days. He didn't say he was God, but he humbled himself and he sat down. He said he asked questions. Nobody knows it all. So he asked questions. He exchanged ideas. And lastly, he said Jesus was focused. He was focused. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was called to do, and he was very focused. Then he said we should ask ourselves, why are you here as leaders? So in other words, purpose is very important. Why am I here? Number two, he told us also, encounter is very important. You must have an encounter. He told us about his own encounter. Number three, he said we must have vision as well. Vision is the blueprint for every purposeful life. Number four, he said we must be a people that have impact. Impact, impact, impact. Then he went on to the development side of the presentation. To, for us to be able to develop ourselves, number one, we are called to equip others. We are called to equip others. And therefore, we must develop them and we must develop ourselves. Number three, skill is very important. It refers us to 2 Timothy 2.16 and the example of David, how David led by the skillfulness of his hand. And number four, training. He emphasized training so much. Number five, seminar and webinar in these days. Number six, he said we must know before we can teach others. Otherwise, it will be like a blind leading a group of other blind men. Training, training is very important. Exercise 10.10, 10, he refers us to that passage. And of course, he also went quickly to discuss about the leadership style of Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, he told us his own leadership style was, number one, he was able to connect with the people. He found common ground with everybody. He said, I've become all things to all men in order that I may be able to save some. So he was able to connect with the people. He was able to engage them. That was what he gave us as his own leadership style, which every leader must be able to do. Number two is, is diligence. He said we can see diligence in everything that Apostle Paul did. And we must be diligent as well. We must make up our mind to develop ourselves. Proverbs 4, verse number 18. And refer us to some other pas passages. Exercises 11, 12, 11, 2. He said we must be versatile. Number three. Number four, he said we must be broad-minded. We must not be close-minded. We must be a people that think outside the box. And I love the fact that he used his own leadership style as an example for us. He's not just telling us as a leadership theoretician, but also as a leadership practitioner. So these are basically what I believe uh, we could take from a uh, summary from his presentation. And of course, he went on to tell us about our Christian social responsibility. How they have gone about it, he gave us example of how they have gone about it in their papa family and also the church where he pastors with the wife. These are very, very important contribution. And to round up, he told us about the things that we need. Number one, salvation. Number two, we must identify our leadership style. Everyone should have one. Number three, we must be a people that read. Leaders are readers. Readers are leaders. Number four, we must have a coach. We must have a mentor. Number five, we must be able to teach others whatever God has imparted to us. He said, this is one of the greatest opportunities that we have 
as leaders ability to be able to teach and to be able to influence others and lastly he said we must be transformational in our approach to leadership we must be transformational we must be agent of change wow once again we want to say a big thank you this is really really a presentation that all of us cannot forget in a hurry the lord bless you again mightily we have we so much appreciate you we are so much thankful for the grace and the gift of god upon your life may god continue to use you to impart your generation in the name of jesus at this time we are going to go into our question and answer time i am sure from the presentation we cannot we don't need anybody to tell us that our guest speaker has everything that it takes to be able to handle the questions that some of us may have in leadership please let me say this before i'm going to hand over to uh to dr evelyn brisbane who is also moderating let, let me say this please the question that is foolish is the question that is not asked and I really want to thank God that our speaker this afternoon, he has interest across board. He has interest in the corporate world. He has interest in his professional world. He's still a practicing attorney. So he also sits on the board of big corporation and high level institutions. So we, we, I believe we have opportunity to be able to put our questions forward and to get some knowledge no nobody learns in isolation we are meant to learn from each other praise the mm -hmm. lord and i believe Fast. that our guest speaker is ready for us with to, to answer some of the questions that might have been agitating our mind in our leadership whether in the home in the church in our various places of work in our career in our profession so over to dr evelyn please Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, wherever. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, uh, Pastor. We really, really appreciate everything you downloaded on us. So a lot of us had our notes scribbling really fast to catch oh, yeah. <laughs> some of the key points that you had. Uh, but a few of them resonated uh, for me as, as um, someone who is in that space. So we haven't received questions yet, but we do have our own questions as moderators that we want to get the conversation going. The first one we have, sir, is in the era of an aging workforce, church leadership is not exempt. Um, at, that, at what point should a pastor start to groom the next set of leaders in the local parish? And what are the things to put in place to ensure that is done effectively? So really more about succession planning. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, you know, as people die, people... Uh, are born. Mm -hmm. So I believe that um, it's a continuum. Um, we need to immediately, like right now, we have various generations, the millennium and all kinds of um, generations that they're talking about. You need to engage them, indeed, from statistics. At least, for example, in Nigeria, the, I mean, I think 70% of, of, of our population uh, are the youth. So they're, they're going to take over. So if you neglect them right now, um, that will be a problem. So um, I believe that immediately every minister needs to try and understand and engage the youth. And I thank God that in the redeemed age of God, we have uh, the, the youth church. I mean, you have an example of Paul and Timothy. You know, you just have to prepare the next generation. Um, many of us, uh, indeed, when our family started, we were a youth church, we were young, under 30. And it is the training that they gave us that is making many of us stand. Many of us didn't go to Bible college. Just this training that we had. And of course, we know that the first thing in RCG is holiness. So the ancient landmarks cannot change. The principle is the same. Methods of dissemination can change. So I believe that um, once the 
foundation is, uh, is, uh, is, is laid. And for example, the youth, they preach at the Holy Ghost service. So I believe that we have a perfect example from my general here. Yeah? And we just have to just um, do it right. Uh, I hope with that I've answered um, your question. Yes, sir. Very much so. Two key things I got from there is immediate engagement and then don't um, don't forget the ancient landmarks. Those are pretty, pretty important for us. My next question while we wait for the, the audience to engage is there are leaders that are visible in the community. Some are innovative in their engagement. Others seem short-lived. What are the tactics for engaging the marketplace and remaining relevant? Well, um, I believe the first thing is to attend webinars like this. You get um, information, knowledge. You have to humble yourself. You know, what you don't know, you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are very innovative indeed. If you are talking last year, late last year, nobody was talking about Zoom. But, you know, when this idea came, a lot of people jumped on. So I believe that the most important is to network, you know. Uh, once you network uh, in the marketplace and hobnob with people, and don't just be proud. I mean, if you don't know something, you say you do not know. And I think um, you can join business clubs, uh, you know, there are all kinds of clubs. Like here, uh, we have our own business club. We call it a business network, where a lot of professionals are there. Uh, and great ideas come. And we invite people to speak to us. Uh, uh, we remember um, even uh, uh, Miles Monroe, you know, of blessed memory. I mean, he was a friend of the house. And, um, you know, he speaks to governments and uh, he brought a lot of ideas and things like that. And we have a lot of leaders in the redeemed church of God that are well lettered. So I believe that, you know, for you to stay relevant, it's even in the vision of the redeemed Christian church of God. If you want a member of the redeemed church of God in every household in the whole world, you need to stay relevant, you know. So I believe that um, that is very, very important and um, God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my next, my next question would be, there are smaller and mid-sized churches that don't have people or money or gifting to pull off what a lot of the large churches can do. And what advice would you give a church to take them from their current state of average to the next level of effectiveness in ministry in a community? Well, I believe that the structure of the Redeemed Center of God um, has um, um, taken care of that because we have um, the regions, we have the provinces, we have the zones, we have the areas, then we have the parishes. And um, every strata has a responsibility um, to lift up, you know, the weak. Uh, and I believe that... Um, there are various ways in which um, we can find out what the issues are. I mean, Jesus Christ showed his, uh, his wounds to people. So there's no point hiding. You know, the stronger churches are supposed to lift up, you know, the, the, the smaller churches. That's why you have that pyramid, you know. So if, if the parish can handle something, they escalate it, you know, um, to the the next one and everybody has their own area of strength uh, and i think um, that is very very important so we just have to lean on each other and pull up you know those that are weak uh, and and just uh, network and, and connect ourselves praise the name of the lord hallelujah mm. hallelujah so we have our first question from youtube now um how can someone identify their leadership style is it possible for someone to assume or is there any objective form of doing this assessment to get an accurate result to know your leadership style? Well, I believe that through various seminars, for example, I put up um, the uh, curriculum um, um, when you go for all these trainings. There are some people who are relational. I mean, a lot of messages Jesus Christ was so relational. Um, that is very, very important. Um, 
But if you go through these seminars, uh, they can point you to and help you develop, you know, mm -hmm. your, your leadership style or the one that works best for you. And of course, you know, there are all kinds of people. There are people who are um, outgoing. There are those that are laid back. You have the sanguine. You have all, all manner of, um, of, 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 of ways that, that people are. I, I believe that you need to submit yourself to coaches, people that would, um, would be um, uh, able to lead you. But really, the point is that you need to be authentic. You need to be real. Like I know my, my, my style. You just, you have to be yourself. God will meet you at your level. There is no point trying to preach like the average American preacher mm. with music and, uh, you know, <laughs> but look at that generous here. He doesn't bounce around. He just stays and preaches in one place. The pitch of his voice is the same all throughout. Mm. Be yourself. The grace that you require for that level, God will grant to you. So be authentic. The most successful people are those that are authentic. You know, we had a pastor once that came and um, he normally preaches, you know, like Nigerian preachers. But he now wanted to change and preach like an American preacher. And um, we had to tell him that it's not working. <laughs> so he had to change back to his authentic uh, self. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> that is so true. Uh, being a, a, an instructor at, a, at, a lo at two local universities here, that's one thing that you're encouraged to do. You have to be authentic. If you're not, people shut off immediately. Um, we have another question. It says, how can a person be if, uh, effective in working a secular job and working as an anointed and productive pastor? How can you combine both? Well, um, there is work balance. And you need to know your prior priority. Um, for me, that's why you need to know your purpose. For me, um, I had an experience once when um, we had a pretty large law firm, my wife and I, and um, one person came to me and said that the way you are going, don't you think you leave this law firm and go into full-time ministry? I said, never. And as I said, never, God opened my ears. For the first time, I had an audible voice of God. He said, never. And from that day, God crashed the practice. That it was just the two of us. All the lawyers left and all that. But I knew that it was a test from God. God wanted me because of the plan of God for my life. He wanted to be first. I'm not full-time, but he wanted to take full attention. I wanted to give it to a crisis practice. So I threw myself into the work of God. I was doing 90% church work. We're not paid. 10% legal practice. And after some years, God saw that I've learned my lesson that seek first, give him priority. Then he brought one client, just one client, that turned around our story. All that we had lost from one job, we got much more than we could ever ask. So um, I believe that um, everyone has his own uh, purpose. My purpose, if you ask me now, if you say, what do I do? I say, I'm a pastor first, then a lawyer. Because mm. God has slapped me. And I know <laughs> my priorities. I'm a pastor first, then a lawyer. So, uh, but don't get paid. It's okay. God pays us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that personal example. Um, we have another question. It says, can you share how RCCG has been able to ensure the younger generation are involved in ministry leadership? How RCCG has ensured that young generation are involved in leadership? Yes. Well, I mean, we now have youth provinces. We have youth provinces led by youth pastors. So I think that is a right step in the right direction. We have um, a pastor seed family where they groom you from, you know, when you're, you're so, so tiny. 
So I, I believe that um, the structure is there. The redeemed Christian Church of God is, 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 I mean, one of the promises is that when Christ comes, he will still find RCCG. So we are going to stay relevant. The structure is there to keep us on the stage till Christ comes. So I think that the fact that they have a youth province, um, that, that would encourage quite a lot of people. And for example, in our Papa family, we were a youth church. And many things that, you know, um, the older church could not do, they gave us those liberties within the ambit of holiness. That's why we could have churches in nightclubs. The general pastor had to shield us because a lot of people could not understand what was going on. How can you have churches in nightclub? But we're nightclub people. So they took church to nightclub so that they can attract us. And that's why we've been able to stay. So I believe that there'll be innovations and um, just make sure that the ancient landmarks are not shifted. That's, a, that, that's important. Another question, sir, is that are we able to use CSR to turn the negative tides around for Christ and benefit mankind? Yeah, that's the whole essence of CSR. CSR is love in action, love of God in action. It is not sufficient to say, I love you, I love you. You have to show it. For God so loved the world that he gave Love without action, even in marital situations, I mean, if there is no action, you, know, you tell your wife, I love you, uh, how about that you don't give her a gift? I love you, December, you don't give her a gift. Easter comes, say, I love you. She said, keep your love. There must be action. The Bible says, love not just in words, but in action. So I believe that um, 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 CSR in itself, being uh, brother's keeper, it's sufficient to transform all the negative things to positive. You show love, you actually show love. And mind you, you have no choice. There's a compelling reason for everybody, corporate and individual, to do CSR. Because that is the question that God is going to ask you on that day. Did you do CSR? Yes mm -hmm. or no? So whether you like it or not, you enjoy it or not or whatever, you have to do it or else. Check that Matthew 25. <laughs> no CSR, no heaven. Mm. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but that's it. Mm. Interesting. It's so true. Uh, core, the core value of a Christian is, is the ability to render service to the very immediate community that you reside in. Uh, I have another question here, sir. How do you monitor the performance of the people that you, are, you have to lead? And what can you do to motivate the team towards uh, performance? Okay, how do you monitor performance? The way the structure is, we have departments and um, uh, we have regular meetings with our workers and um, we have performance indexes and we measure. Uh, we measure performance also. Uh, we have the KPI. Uh, we have a workers directorate, you know, that makes sure that, um, you know, we do what we're supposed to, to do. And most especially, as a leader, you must lead by example. You must be accountable. So the kind of leadership that we are asked to uh, do is servant leadership. You must be accountable. And you must lead by example. Don't tell people to do what you are not able to do. Mm -hmm. The grace to do it, God will grant you. So basically, I believe that when they see that if you say they should do something, you are the first to do it. For example, building fund. You are telling them to bring money so that you can build. Yeah, they, they will check what, how much has pastor put down. So if you lead by example, it's encouraging for followers, you know, to follow you. And that's what our Lord and Master Jesus Christ did. He led by example. He washed the feet of his disciples. He says, if you want to be great, be a servant. He showed them. So I believe that's the secret. And then you have to measure performance on a regular basis. 
So that one is a major one, the metrics part. I think we, we, we have a lot to learn in that space. So uh, Pastor Kuya, I believe that you have some questions as well. So I will um, yield space for you to do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, once again, uh, we've received some uh, comments from, you, from YouTube and the other platform wanting to say, the leaders wanted to say, this session has been very, very impactful to them. And they send their, you know, they sent their, you know, their thanks to our guest speaker that you spoke in a very practical way. And they are able to connect, especially some of them said they are by vocational and they are able to connect with you regarding your presentation and the response to your question. Now, um, I have a few questions, uh, but I want to believe that uh, the last word that you spoke really resonates with me when it comes to how do you uh, measure any performance? Because it's almost said that uh, whatever gets measured, gets done. And whatever gets done, gets rewarded. So I really, you know, I believe in that principle a lot. The measurement aspect that you put into the, into the answer. Now, uh, we have a few questions here from YouTube and uh, some other platform. Uh, one is from, uh, from one of our leaders and pastors. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your insightful and anointed presentation. Now, he said in an environment, this is a question, in an environment like Nigeria, where government policies are uncertain and corruption is very rife, how are you able to navigate the system, especially when doing business with government agencies? I ask this because you wear many hats, a clergy, an attorney, and a businessman. Thank you. Well, I mean, the first thing is integrity. Mm. Integrity. Um, the Bible says that let your yes be your yes. Um, of course, it will be tough. The Bible says that pass through the narrow gate. You make sure that you sign agreements that tells each person what belongs to them. But you see, sometimes you want to set standards. For example, we have an event center that we call the incubator. There we said that we are not going to serve alcohol. It was tough. We just wanted to change. A, a religion that does not change the culture of people is mm -hmm. not effective. So we said no other. Um, as we started, about four event centers came next to us. So we're losing people, you know, to all these other event centers. But we said no, we're not going to change. We need to tell people that you can have a party without alcohol and then corporate organizations came and started using us because at their business meetings at their board meetings and things they don't serve alcohol, alcohol. True. so god helped us but we were able to just maintain a stand it is not so much about how much you get at the end of the day a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession mm -hmm. but if you can minister even through your business that i'm going to do it right and right now you see that you know there are a lot of christian businesses there are a lot of christian people who are who are who are on top of um, businesses and i've told you like i said in my presentation that the engine that drives change is leadership so if the leader is righteous he'll make sure that everybody is righteous that's right and i'm sure that there are many corporations like that like, for example, there are some banks in Nigeria that you don't give their, their you go, they pack your car, you don't give tips. Some don't even give you Christmas gifts. So that is not a question of you, you and they won't accept from you. So the culture is changing little by little because of the people who are on top. And I believe that, um, like, God compensated me for my loss in the law practice. Like I said, I lost business for many years. It was so bad. Thank God for an enterprising wife. 
we didn't have business before we had we were doing great but when i had that voice god just killed the whole thing but when god turned around my captivity just one one brief and that brief i didn't go to court it was just a phone call some corporate people came to nigeria they wanted to set up an oil company and they lost they bidded for a job they lost and then they wanted to go somebody just called me do you know anybody any member of yours in uh, nnpc that can at least do something so i called one man and said okay to encourage foreign investors split the contract 70 30 they lost but give them 30 percent so they split it the people stayed and they put me on the board of the company international multinational company just one phone call that's how god works so what you think you have lost by the time god compensates you you know it pays to serve the lord there is pain there's challenge but it pays at the end of the day Amen. so i'd like to encourage everybody just do it by the book it might be taught sometimes and the holy spirit will guide you Amen. Amen. ultimately your Amen. conscience will speak to you Amen. god will help us in jesus name Amen. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pastor ID. Um, I know that uh, this is a question that agitates the mind of uh, uh, most of us, possibly, who have been professional before we are called into what we are doing, especially in several terrains. But what I've heard you said, to, to cap it, is number one is integrity. Number two is your conviction. And number three, the culture. In other words, the culture that the culture that we create determines what we get. And uh, I so much love your, you know, I love your your personal testimony that you share with us. It reminds me of uh, the the owner founder of uh, Chick Fil A, this big restaurant chain today. I uh, reading his autobiography. I was made to understand that uh, when he started this restaurant, because he was a Christian, a practicing Christian, and a Sunday school teacher in Southern Baptist Church in Atlanta. He made up his mind. He was not going to open on Sunday. And people said, oh, this guy, you are foolish. That <laughs> Sunday is when most restaurants make the biggest sale. But he made up his mind. He wasn't going to open on Sunday. And to the glory of God, 20, 30 years running, before he passed, he has a testimony that what he was making in six days of opening was much more than what some restaurant of the same size were making in seven days and plus. So uh, I want to believe that uh, uh, the, the, if we remain faithful, like you have said, God is going to compensate us, is going to reward us. Thank you very much for that contribution. The next question that I have here is, uh, the, 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 this viewer said, there are some people in life that are more or less leaders. They have, you see them, you see leadership. Uh, from youth, but there are some that when you see them, it's just a follower that you see. In everything they do, they can't be bothered. They don't want to raise their game to any level. It's now asking the question, can a born follower be groomed or trained to be a leader? Honestly, to him, to me, everyone can be a leader. Can they? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, Hallelujah. Like I, said, like I said, be authentic. But you see, a leader without a follower is just taking a walk. Mm. Everybody has a role. Even Jesus had followers. The general said has followers. So it depends on how you see yourself, your self esteem. The fact that you are a follower doesn't mean you should have a low self-esteem. Yeah. Aaron and all, they lifted up the hand of, uh, of um, Moses. You know, without Aaron and all, they would have lost that battle. So, you see, uh, there are various strata of society. We can't all be number one there, you know. I mean, the leader. There are some people that are followers. Everybody is important. Mm. But if you are a follower and you want to become a leader, uh, that's why we have all these seminars and training. They tell you a few things that you can do. And with God on your side, 
Uh, you will be a leader. You start leading from the home. You don't just go and sit on top of a big corporation. You start leading from your home. If you can lead from your home, then you can step out and lead a uh, workers' uh, group. Then from workers' group, you, you know, it's, it's just, I mean, when I became a pastor, I was an usher. I had not pastored before. I had not preached a sermon before. From ushering to pastoring, it wasn't easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy. But I'm saying that you can grow okay. to be who you want to be. I believe that everybody, if the Holy Spirit is inside you, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But you must know your area of strength. You must know your area of strength. If you are an introvert, there are some things you can do. You can be a thinker. If you are an extrovert, there are some things you can do. So you know yourself, but be authentic. I believe that your blessing comes from your area of, 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 um, of, of strength, you know. But of course, you can, you, can, you can be whoever you want to be. Praise the Lord. Again, I mean, very, very precise, very insightful. Um, to the person asking the question, if you are a follower now, uh, our guest speaker has made us to understand that you can be a leader. As long as, number one, you're authentic, you know yourself, you know your gifting, you know your personality. Number two, he also made us to understand that wherever you are in the organizational structure, uh, strata, you can influence. In other words, I believe he's talking about 360 degree leadership. Wherever you are, you have a role to play in the organization. And your position is as important as the input you put into that position. And uh, that's some of the things that I can hear from uh, the fact that you are number two or number three does not mean that you are not a leader. Uh, it's it told us that not everybody is going to be number one. Uh, there are some people that will be number one, others will have to follow them. And that reminds me of uh, the, the last, uh, the vice president of the US that served George Bush too. Uh, we are made to understand that is good as a number two, but never as a number one. <laughs> but the role of number two is sad creditably in that role in various in, in various uh, various levels. So thank you very much. The next question that we have before I'm going to turn it over again is: This person is asking, what strategy can be used to equip the church on cultural sensitivity? Mm and cultural awareness to win souls to Christ in whatever, whatever part of the world we find ourselves. Since God has used you as a speaker to write what we could call a blueprint on especially Christian social responsibility, and for you to be able to do that well, I believe uh, you, there, there must be something about the, the cultural content of the environment where you are and where you are writing for that made you to be able to do this. So if that is the question. What strategy can be used to equip the church on cultural sensitivity and cultural awareness to win souls to Christ in whatever part of the world we find ourselves? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, in CSR, the first thing you need to do is to do a needs assessment. Mm -hmm. You don't carry coal to uh, Newcastle. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand the terrain, do a recce. Like I said, um, our pastors that pastor in Germany and in all those places, Philippines, like the city of David, have about we have about forty churches in the Philippines. When we were we were we started, we had you know Nigerian pastors and all that, but we saw that unless they learn the language. The people cannot accept you. You know, Jesus was so fused into his disciples. They couldn't differentiate him. That's why somebody had to come and kiss him. That the one I kiss is Jesus. So he blended. So I believe that if you are going to affect any culture, you need to first study, understand, then 
and be aware of the environment you are. What are the needs? Like we found out that in church planting in the Philippines, we had to go in breaking through CSR. You don't just go and plant a church. What are their needs? They need CSR. So we went through CSR. There are some church, some countries, it was football. That's how we came in. So I believe that um, um, you are, just have to study and understand where you are going so that whatever you want to do there can be acceptable even unto them. You know, I, I went for a dinner with some Japanese um, uh, uh, clients. And um, after you had your dinner, they bring a dish of rice. If you take a dish if you take a spoon say that ah let me uh not sound like as if i'm not enjoying this meal they'll be offended because that means that their food their their their, their food is not is not is not good is not whatever but for an african you just want to show that ah, uh, this food is sweet you take a spoon but no but what they're trying to say is that okay all of us are filled up right now so that is just like a decoration so if you don't know that you will offend your audience so i think that the first thing is just to do a needs assessment understand the culture of the people and uh, the sensitivity of where you are going uh, and god will help us in jesus mighty name amen yeah i think uh but once again uh it has been it's been very it's been very upfront with the things that we need to do and I want to believe that, uh, I think he mentioned during his presentation that uh, they've written some books which can guide us. Uh, please, let's avail ourselves of some of those resources. I mean, they're out there. I mean, God has blessed them to be able to write them out there so that it can be a blessing to us. Now, but I have a question that just immediately came in, which this person is very passionate about. He wants to input on it as a senior pastor in the mission because it has some local content there. The question is this. He says, sir, how do you survive as a worker in RCCG under a crop of church leadership who does not seem to embrace positive changes in kingdom advancement and still remain traditional in their approaches? This becomes noticeable especially when you are bringing positive energy, like spiritual oh. gifts, that might advance the kingdom business. Some see your spiritual gifts as a threat compared to their own, to, compared to their own, that is the leaders. Please help expatiate on this. <laughs> well, I think um, that is why the vision of the redeemed city of God is to have churches every five minutes, at least in Nigeria, every five minutes uh, uh, distance. So really, if you are in a place that is just not working, I believe that, number one, you have options. Mm. Number two, check your approach. Maybe you are a sign and wonder minister under a pastor who is a teacher. Come on, come on. Humble yourself. Come on. Come there on. are various giftings. But if you now are drawing people to yourself because you are doing signs and wonders, and uh, you uh, because you are a prayer warrior, people are coming to you. Are you yourself? You have to just check your approach. It's so important. You know, and I think most of the time it's because the people are not humble. If you are humble, um, people love to progress. But you know, there are some pastors that are traditional. You take them to the US, they don't change. The intonation don't change. All those things don't change. The food do, does not change. It's still the same Amala and the Pandejam and all that. They, they can't eat burger and all those things. They just don't change. Well, you just need to know that uh, this man uh, is just not going to change. So why, why slam your head against the wall? You know, you just walk, you know. So I don't know. You know, we have to look at each situation, situation uniquely. you know, uh, personally and see how we can best advise you. But I think that you should go to um, any of your leaders in wherever you are 
uh, and um, uh, and get um, proper advice and other. But please humble yourself. There is a place for signs and wonders. There is a place for holiness. There is a place for teachers. There is a place for pastors. You know, some people have signs and wonders, but they don't. They're not. They're not. They, they don't have love. Mm. They can't be good administrators. You know. So, I mean, everybody has to work together. As we have said, we are the body of Christ. Some are hands. Some are, 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 are you know, the neck. Some are the bomb, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody is important. David, even though he had been anointed king, was still serving a servant mm -hmm. to Saul. So I pray that... Um, your time, can I, if you can't take it, then go and start the church. Now, I'm sure that they will give you your own church where you can just be yourself and do whatever you want to do. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, you know, yeah. I once again, I want to say a big thank you. Uh, there are so many questions that are like manner to the one that you just, you know, you just answered. So we won't, uh, you know, won't bother going into all those questions again. But what I can take from what you have said. To the person that asked the question and to some others who might be in similar situation is that number one is that you check your approach every leader has a style and every follower also has a personal style so number one check your approach number two speak with your leaders because some of these cases some of these issues they are case specific so they may not be one cap fits all kind of situation and number three that you have options as well I mean, after you study for a while, examine things, uh, probably you need to pray to God and then make a decision. Now, um, there, there is a question here uh, before I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Evelyn. Uh, again, this person is asking the question from the background of part of your presentation that looks like uh, you are a bit connected to those the eyes and the ups that is in politics, especially in the environment where you are. And the principles of interaction and engagement, connection remain the same anywhere. It's, it, the, the question is this, with that background, it says when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear it through, the people mourn. And now it said, sir, what is your view on Christians being involved in politics at leadership level well i mean it is it is now an injunction mm. <laughs> from the general side that we need to be involved you need to be involved to change because the change cannot come from outside it can only come from inside That's right. if you are not a member of a party you can't influence anything from the primaries, they tell you who is going to be leader, whether you like it or not. And the general Garcia has said that every one of us should join parties, be card carry members of parties. I mean, right now, uh, we had a, 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 a seminar in 2015 we call this faith and politics and the present vp and some other governors came to speak on that platform we were bold enough to say that this time around a christian must be there so we campaigned for him we supported him and today the rest is history and right now I'm sure that because he's well positioned, he's influencing policies. There are some things that our government would not do without asking him. It's a tough terrain, but little by little. For example, we had a Christian elder who was um, chairman of a brewery company. A lot of people complained, why did he go and work in a brewery and all that? But because it was there, they started making malt drinks. They started making not just alcoholic drinks. You know, there was a line, a brand, a lot of drinks 
that were not alcoholic. There is no way that would have happened if it was not inside. So I believe that unless we get involved, we cannot change anything. And it is about time everybody becomes a card carrying member. Because the Christian community, we're, we're a lot, a lot of people, but if we don't have candidates, there's no way we can influence policy, we can get there. So I believe that um, it's important for us to get involved in politics. It's the only way you get there that there can be transformation, true transformation. And God will help us. We are the light of the world. Amen. We are the Amen. salt of the earth. God is waiting for us mm. to change circumstances, to change things, to change the face of politics. And I pray that um, God will grant us the wherewithal to get involved in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I think uh, Pastor again has spoken as somebody who has uh, some level of uh, uh, authority on this, at least uh, the ear of the, the system uh, as to whatever may be their, you know, their mindset regarding us being involved in politics. What has made us to understand is that we must have to be involved. Yeah, that is the only way we can influence. As it's almost said, if you are not on the menu, you can never be on the table. And when all is said and done, it's only those who are on the table that are going to partake of whatever is available on the table. So uh, thank you very much for this contribution. Some, a lot of people, I believe, have this, uh, you know, this question, you know, bothering them that, you know, can I involve in this? Can I get involved in this? So thank you very much for your approach, not only from the secular, but even from the biblical perspective. Jesus speaking to us that we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. So at this time, I'm going to, once again, I have quite a number of questions already lined, have sent from you two. But let me turn over to Pastor Evelyn, Dr. Evelyn, to please for the next 10 minutes before we begin to round up. If there are questions also that we have from our end that we want our guest speaker to give us a light on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I've learned quite a few things today. I have uh, a few questions, like I said, that we had put together. Um, some of them still building up on some of the things you have shared, but just going a little bit, you know, in a bit of a narrow space. So the first one I want to ask is really about the, um, the health and wealth of a, of a pastor. We're experiencing a worldwide pandemic, and the reopening strategies varies from location to location, even within the countries that we reside, how should a pastor leading the church and ministry keep focused without being overwhelmed? Well, I believe that um, if you are not alive, <laughs> you can't minister. Um, health, they say, is wealth. Every country has the protocol. And I believe that you need to put the interest of your congregation members uh, at heart and obey all the protocols. This pandemic is, is real, but I'd like to tell people that it's not the first pandemic. We've had worse pandemics. We've had the Spanish pandemic that 50 million people died all over the world. So we should not be afraid um god will protect his own but faith without works is dead you have to follow the protocol and don't tempt god wash your hands social distancing cover your your, your mouth with uh, your, your mask and things like that um and uh, and, uh, and i believe that um it behoves on on the pastors to lead by example just follow the government protocol i mean we've seen churches closed because um you know pastors uh, broke the the protocol um so i i just want to encourage um all the pastors that god is still on the throne Amen. and um, he will protect us he'll protect us uh this virus is real mm. it's real and um but i i believe that the word of god is real also the blood of jesus is more than able to protect us and hide us, you know, under the shadow of his wings. Amen. 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 
as still continuing on the um, space for you know being part of the social and um, public discourse, using Apostle Paul as one of our reference points. From your experience, how can a pastor engage in such a public discourse without losing hold of the mission and the integrity of personal salvation? Well, I mean, Paul did not lose hold of integrity mm. and personal salvation. Those are the examples to follow. You see, the Bible says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and did not love their lives unto death. Mm. If you are willing to lose your life, you will save it. But if you are holding back, you will lose it. So I believe that for those of us pastoring, you need to ask yourself a question. Are you willing to die for this? Hmm. The Christians of old, they were thrown to lions. They said to die is gain. Many of us are held down by the treasures of this world. But we need to think of eternal treasures. Jesus says, set your heart on things that are above. So I believe that if truly you are committed, if truly you know your assignment, if truly you know that even if you live a hundred years on this earth, there is an eternity and you will give an account, you render an account. Well, you'll be focused. You will do anything. Suffering comes, praise God. All, one thing we know is that the end of the Lord is always good. When it's all said and done, you'll have a testimony. So you see Christians, some Christians die, some suffer and all that, but you need to be focused. You must be willing to die for what you are preaching. That is the standard. If terrorists are willing to die because of their faith. What are we talking about? There is this Leah Shaibu girl who was uh, arrested by Boko Haram. All the other girls, many of them, they denied Christ. They became Muslims and they left them. She said, no, I'm not going to do that. This is a little girl, 15-year-old or 12-year-old. So when you have people like that as beacons of light, please, I think we need to take these things seriously. God says, it's either you are hot or cold. If you are lukewarm, it will spew you out of his mouth. So if you are going to be hot, be hot. If you are going to be cold, be cold. Don't do it. But if you are doing it, you have to do it as Christ did it. William Tyndale was burnt at stake because it translated the Bible into English. That's why we can read it now. So some people have laid down their lives for this thing. If you are sure you are not called out for it, then don't do it. That's why the Bible says that don't rush to be a leader. They're going to be mm. accountable. Mm. So the grace to stand, they said we are chosen the furnace of affliction. Many of us are playing church. When the, 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 the stakes are down, or how do they say, are you still going to be standing? Mm. Or you give up and run? Little excuse, no money, no, no excuse. We have no excuse. He that lays his hand on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus says that you must hate your father, hate your mother. You know, the standard is just high. It's too high. But the grace to do it right, God will grant to us in Jesus' name. Some are doing it. There's no looking back. We've carried in a power family, they, they told us that it's a pot of blood. You've carried this, you've carried it. And that's how it's going to be. Ah, uh, God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I have I have a question here from a pastor. He says, um, can a born leader also be groomed to be a follower? Well, I, I reckon that is um, that is true. I mean, a born leader can be a follower because you the, you are demoted from being a leader. It can be a test from God. God wants to see your heart whether 
you are submissive. He tests you. He's going to test or the word of God that you preach will test you. God tested uh, Abraham. He says, okay, I know you love this son. You prayed for 25 years for this child. Now go and sacrifice the child for me. Go and sacrifice it for me. He went ahead. He almost caught the neck of Isaac. He was sold out for God. Our God is a jealous God. And he will test you. He will test every one of us. So you are a leader today. He can make sure that tomorrow you are a follower. Just be faithful. That's why I said at the end of the Lord is always good. Look at Job. Just be faithful. We might not understand it. We might not be able to explain it. When you can't track God, just trust him. Mm. Job said, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So just trust him. So I believe that a leader can be a follower. It could be a test from God. You know, and by the time you are a leader and you are now a follower, you know more <laughs> than followers because you've been there. So I believe that, um, you know, God will help us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 I like that. It's, it's, mm. you have to be tested. Your character is important as leaders. So as leaders, we ignore or simply miss those critical moments because so much of the current model of Sunday morning worship now is based online and um, there are comparisons being done amongst pastors who are delivering in the online space. What are some key nuggets that a pastor needs to have to ensure their, co their content remains relevant and that souls are nourished regardless of the status of life that, of the audience that is watching? Well, I mean... Number one, you have to understand the sign of the times. Like many of our online sermons, I mean, for example, the first one was lockdown for miracles. And we quoted a scripture that says that, look, enter into your homes, lock yourself inside for a season until this pandemic is over. And then we, we talked about those that were locked down, like the widow that had oil, you know. Uh, she, was, she locked herself in. By the time she came out, I mean, she had a testimony. The children, yeah. there, they locked themselves in on the, day of, uh, on the night of uh, Passover. By the time they, they went out, you know, they, 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 they had a testimony. So you need to identify the times. If you are preaching, there's COVID out there. People are on lockdown. You need to be innovative. You need to prepare. Engage. There should be questions and answers. Mm -hmm. You know? There should be campaigns. You need feedbacks from people. You need to innovate. For you to stay relevant, you can't be preaching the, 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 the sermons that you used to pick. Uh, you know, people need to be encouraged. People need hope. So you need to just make sure that you, you stay relevant. And that's why it's important for you to know what is going on around you, like the children of Kisaka. You have to understand what's going on and know what to tell the people and engage them. There has to be stakeholder engagement. Like our, our, our Digging Deep service, our Tuesday services is, is engaging. I mean, we have, people ask questions. We give them questions. We, we give them homework. And they go and answer the questions. And that was the time we get some questions. 557 people answered the questions on our platforms. Mm. Relevant questions. And they gave all kinds of, and we gave them gifts for answering. So a lot of people are online now. They're engaging, at least at midweek. And most importantly, pastors, shorten your messages. The duo preaches for 30 minutes now. We used to preach for one hour, one and a half hour. Now we do 30 minutes. We do 20 minutes. I preach 20 minutes. It wasn't like that before. But the attention span of people is not there. online. No way. And they have choice. If you are too long, they'll move away. Then your equipment must be stable. You have to invest in online equipment so that your, your transmission can be stable. 
because people will leave. God will help us. And of course, lastly, during the lockdown, we gave a lot of palliatives to people. You have to reach out to your members. You have to show love. We gave bribes, we gave egg, we gave money, we gave all kinds of things. That's the way to keep them. And I believe that um, um, that's one of the things that you got to do. Um, God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so, so much, sir. Uh, I will hand over to Pastor Kuya. Yeah, I think we are getting to, thank you very much, uh, our, our guest speaker and uh, Dr. Evelyn. Uh, we are, get, we are gradually rounding up. Now, uh, this is my personal question. Um, each of the, when you are doing your presentation and even during the question and answer time, I see that uh, you speak deliberately, I want to believe, about your wife. Um, the, I've, I've seen on the internet a few things, on the social media, a few things about you and your wife. Um, you speak so fondly of her, so affectionately of her. Um, my question is this. Uh, how do we maintain this balance uh, when it comes to, especially for us as leaders, between our family responsibility, the church responsibility, and our secular responsibility? How do we maintain the balance and keep the, the home front? Uh, you know, as because we have that problem in leadership today. That yeah, people are great preachers. They are there out. They are out there. People know about them. But when you get to the other side, that is the you know the home front, it's not as good as as it should be. That God will be very proud of. So please, can you give us a few tips on that as leaders from leadership perspective? Thank you. Well, I've written a book um, um, on love. Uh, it's on the internet. And my sweetheart also has written a book. Um, I met my sweetheart uh, 40 years ago. Come on. And we've been married for 30 years. I met her at the age of 16. So we, we've grown with her, uh, with each other. Um, the, the, the standard is God first, then family, then church. Um, so it's important if the family is not together it's going to affect your ministry life if you fight with your wife in the morning and you want to come and minister i remember there was a time i had a tiff with my my sweetheart and i was preparing a sermon downstairs i fought with her upstairs and god opened my ears and i had pastor ah i knew what god meant i had to run up even though i thought i was right i had to apologize so home is important, very, very important. And God has blessed me with a wonderful woman, um, beautiful in and out. Uh, and I, 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 I made sure that I don't call her Shiju, because if you look at the Bible, I mean, they don't use such, I mean, uh, Sarah called uh, um, her husband, uh, Abraham, Lord. You know, uh, Abisha called uh, Solomon love, you know. Um, so I call her sugar baby, you know. Uh, I call her choco milo. I call her sweetie pie. Because whatever you call, I mean, they changed the name of Abraham from Abraham to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And that was how the, the, um, the, the miracle happened. Because mm -hmm. as you declare it, so shall it be. They called him Abraham, father of many nations. Abraham just means, sorry, Babake, he's just a, a man. But when he changed to Abraham, it was a prophecy. So if you are calling your wife sugar, she will be sweet now. Mm -hmm. So that was one secret. So we call ourselves by those terms of endearment, and we honor our wives. You see, the Bible says that the Christian marriage is like the marriage of Christ and the church. So, I mean, the church doesn't have a problem submitting to Christ. So, wives, you don't have a problem submitting to, to Christ. And then there must be expressions of love. So, the home front is so important. Just model your marriage as Christ 
and the church. How does the church relate to Christ? Do the same thing. You'll be out of trouble. And of course, if you are working, that should be a balance. A lot of people, you know, they overwork themselves in the secular and they can't just perform and things like that. So it's so important for us to find a balance. But you see, the priority is that God first, then the family. A lot of Christian families are complaining that the pastors stay in church, they are married to the church, and the church belongs to God. God says, I can build my church. So why are you staying in church 24-7? Spend time with family. That's, why, that's, that's one of the miracles of this COVID-19 COVID series. They locked all of you inside. Some will fight, but you finish it. At the end of it all, you see that you know your, your marriage is stronger. So I want to encourage um, everyone to make sure that you are intentional concerning your relationships um, because God is intentional concerning our relationship and God will help us in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah, Amen. thank you very much, uh, you know, Pastor ID. Um, this is very, very important. I think I've received some, some other questions here relating to what you have just uh, shared with us. So we have to be intentional and then in being intentional, God is first. Then the next is our relationship with our spouse or our family generally. And then expression of love every time. Let's follow the principle that Jesus laid down for us in the Bible. Him being the head of the church and Christ as a bride. And he took very good care of it. So let us be intentional. As he often said, it's easier for God to replace you in your place of work then it is easier for God to re it's easier for God to replace you in your ministry and in your vocation than for God to replace you in your family. That is very important. God cannot easily replace us in our family, but it's easier for God to replace us in the ministry. It's easier for God to replace us in whatever profession we belong. Now there are quite a number of questions that have come in, but it, all are tending towards the same thing. Now. Uh, and I also have a question along the same line. So I'm just going to roll everything together. Now, the question some people have asked is this, that some of them possibly have had about your ministry and the, particularly the church that you pastor, the city of David, that they know, you know, the, you know, the influential people, the wealthy people and the congregation. But yet, you also have some, you know, low-income earners in the congregation. The question is, and I think I've watched some of your clip online, especially one where you are uh, interviewing a guy who was blown so, so much big grammar, and you are telling him, so what did God do? And it was so funny. I mean, it was, I love watching it time and time. I've watched it about 10 times. <laughs> you know, the way you <laughs> and the guy, the exchange between you and this, uh, this young man. Now, you have those kind of people in your congregation. And some people have sent questions that they also know probably they have even friends who are, you know, who are the wealthy people in your congregation. The question is this. How have you been able to carry both the wealthy, the educated, the uneducated, and the poor? Well, men not necessarily be the poor. How have you been able to carry all this, uh, this diverging demographics in your congregation? And still, be, to get them to be coming back every Sunday to listen to you. Thank you. Well, it's the grace of God. Amen. And um, we have a slogan which I started with. We said, this is the city of David where the love of God reigns. Hmm. So we have to show the love of God to all and sundry. It's not about your position in life. We have welfare, a charity bank for those that need welfare. We have a hospital that does free interventions, subsidized interventions. We have a dialysis unit. So we can, we can take care of, of your, your issue. Mm. We say it is where dreams come true. We must not despise the days of little beginnings. The rich people, they didn't, many of them are not born rich. So we have departments that would teach you how to fish. We have a can can make a difference when we feed everybody. And your dreams as 
a not so rich person can change. Mm. We network. Amen. There are some services for singles. We make sure that they speak to somebody there, that they sit strategically. So we meet everybody's needs. We call them legends. Mm. You are legendary. You know, we, we, we let them feel good about themselves. Mm. Like that guy that you are talking to in that, in that um, 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 script. We call him Professor. Come on. <laughs> he is very, very good. And we tell people that, look, improve yourself. And because of that clip, a lot of people call, call him out to now mm. speak at occasions. We paid for his education. He's done the first degree. Now he's doing a master's in the university. So we build them up by the grace of God because we love them. Mm. Amen. And Amen. the Bible says that if a rich man comes to your church, you take him to the front seat. He <laughs> says that's not right because if a poor man comes, you tell him to go and sit in the back. He says that's not right. So just follow how Jesus has taught us. But the most important thing and the greatest law is the law of love. The greatest commandment. When Jesus came, there were 600 commandments or more. But he said, I'm going to give you just one commandment, not other commandments. It says, love God with all your heart, love him with all your soul, love him with all your mind. He says, and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, love one another as I have loved you. So if you, and he says that love fulfills the law. So if I love you, I won't be nasty to you. If I love you, I will steal. If I love you, I will fornicate. If I, you know, so love, that's our focus. That's the foundation of the city of David. Love. Amen. Amen. And Amen. God is love. Amen. So that's why we know that um, the Bible says that God never, um, love never love fades. Never yeah. Amen. Lord, love endures. God Amen. never dies. So Amen. our foundation is love. Just show love Amen. to everybody. Because the poor man today, all our leaders, what's their pedigree? Mm. Who was their father? That's right. The poor man today mm. can be a big man tomorrow. Amen. So Amen. build dreams. Mm. Think mm. big. Mm. See the big picture. How God has seen you. Don't despise the days of little beginnings. Yeah. Because there's a seed of greatness in you. Our mm. own is to harness you. Help you know the talents that God has given unto you. That was one day we were talking about talents. And one man now started making uh, food. Mm. And we patronized him. Today is big time. Mm. Uh, there is one other guy who was a cripple, came to church. We gave him money. Mm. Now he has his own business. Another one came, we set up a barbing shop for him. He sold it. <laughs> So we, we just try and, uh, and, and meet everybody at their point of need. But the foundation is love. Yeah, thank you very much, Pastor Heidi. Before, um, as we begin to round up, um, there is one I'm going to turn over to, uh, to Dr. Evelyn for her own party shot and then to, you know, to lead us in prayer to round up. But before I do that, um, uh, let me say that uh, I've had, I think I have one, two, three pastors that you have been really a personal encouragement to, that you really showed that you care for them when they were going through difficult time. Uh, and, uh, you know, they shared it with me personally, who pastors in the axis, where your church is. So, uh, and I want to believe that whatever you have shared with us, I want to commend it to everybody online tonight. Uh, you have not just shared from the book. You have shared what you do in a practical way. Um, I didn't know that we are going to have this opportunity for us to be able to say this. But just to, uh, to, 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 to put together that which you shared with us regarding the last question, number one is your vision as a pastor. Your vision. Number two is love. Love. Love, love. He emphasized that several times. Number three, welfare. Let the welfare of the people, let it be of primary importance. Number four, show hospitality. 
Number five, empowerment. Empower those who need empowerment in the congregation. The, the, those who are the destitute of David today, they can be the great army of David tomorrow. And then networking is number six that you share with us. Networking. We need to network even those who are those who are professionals, who are this, who are that in the church. We need to network as the people and then legends, legends, legends. Uh, people tend to become whatever we call them, whatever we make of them, whatever we make them believe about themselves. Thank you very much. Now, my parting question. The question I want to ask is this, sir? Can you give us? Uh, Above every other thing, one thing that you will want us as leaders, aspiring leaders, uh, to a key success factor in leadership, that if you don't think about any other thing, always think about this. Well, and I, uh, as you answer the question, sir, before you answer the question, let me say, because once you answer the question, I think I'm going to immediately turn it over. So just one thing that you want us to watch out for. Thank you. Well, um, if you ask me, the one thing that I think is most important, is critical, is the fear of God. Is the fear of God that helped Joseph. There was nobody around. And Potiphar's wife, wife says, come, lie with me. He says, <laughs> you're beautiful, but if I do it, I'll be sitting against God. God. He didn't say Potiphar. God. There is a cloud of witnesses. Mm. They're watching us. If you have the fear of God, you, you to keep you on the right track. Amen. Amen. And I believe that that's, that's a key. That, that might be one other key, but for me, because God will deal with you. If he called you, he would chastise you. Mm. He told Jonah, go to Nineveh. He went somewhere else. God sent a storm. At the time you sent you that you are doing, he brought him back. He will compel you. So why do you want to drink water? And uh, be inside belly for three days. Ooh, ooh. I mean, sorry. <laughs> Just obey him. Fear him. <laughs> and it will be well with you. So I think that's one of the. Well, thank you. Once again, I want to say a big thank you. Thank you for who you are and for what you do, what you bring to the Christendom. Uh, we're so, we've been so much blessed, we've been so much impacted. And please, we want to let you know that we appreciate the time that you have spent with us impacting our lives. Kindly please give our love to Pastor Shiju, your, your Choco Milo, your sweetheart, and your sugar baby. Please give our love to her. God bless you, sir. So over to Dr. Evelyn, please, to round us up and then pray for the next five minutes. Thank you. Amen. Uh, and I want to add my voice to that um, gratitude as well. Thank you so much, Pastor, for taking time to honor us and to share with us your experiences. Uh, one thing I can never forget are two things, in fact, that, I, that has resonated so much with me. They are more of affirmation. One, be authentic to who you are. Don't try to walk someone else's journey. And two, which is also very important to me, is the ability to continually learn. You don't have a fountain of knowledge. And so thank you so, so much. Uh, so to round this up, I just want us to share a quick prayer. Everlasting Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for this time that you've given on to us to learn at your feet. Thank you for your son that you have used this time. Lord, we pray that the virtue that he has poured onto us today, Lord God, you will replenish. We pray, oh God, for we the hearers, that the words we have heard today will not be held uh, against us, but it will help us to be testimonies of grace. Yes. That wherever we go, we will remember this message, that indeed we are the light of the world, that indeed we live in a fishbowl, that we will be true testi testifiers of your greatness. And just as you have used your son to remind us that Jesus Christ left a legacy, Help us, oh God, to leave a legacy in every space, in every scenario, in every sphere of life that you've given unto us. Help us not to misuse the platform that you've given unto us. Let our lives continually 
be a living testimony of your greatness and of your goodness. This we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Looking forward to the evening session. Thank you, Pastor ID. We appreciate your contribution here. Thank you very much. God bless you. Somebody say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.